In its long and storied history, country music has always held a special place aside for female performers, whether as artists or instrumentalists. It took a long time for this to be recognised. There wasn't a woman with a million selling country song until 1935. No solo woman was ever a grand old Opry member until 1952. And there was no woman in the Hall of Fame until 1973. That said, let's explore some of the more illustrious denizens of that special place, the ground they broke and the great records that they made. Arkansas's own Patsy Montana owes in part her career to an enormous watermelon. Her brothers, having cultivated the behemoth, travelled from Hope, Arkansas to the Chicago World's Fair and Patsy tagged along, mainly to meet up with a couple of pen pals who happened to be professional singers. They arranged an audition with Patsy as a band singer, but during her audition she couldn't help but break out in the giggles. The producer saw more value in her as a novelty singer and arranged an audition with the house band on WLS in Chicago, where she became a very popular performer. Very shortly, she and her band the Prairie Ramblers were recording on cheapy labels like Banner and Melatone. In 1935, her theme song I Want to Be a Cowboy Sweetheart sold over a million copies at a time when it was rare for a country single to sell a million copies and became one of the touchstone songs of early country music. Patsy kept recording until 1942 when she stopped to raise a family. She died in 1996 at the ripe old age of 88, immortalised forever as the cowboy sweetheart and the model for Jessie, the yodelling cowgirl in Toy Story. Born and raised in Nashville, Kitty Wells is a bona fide superstar of country music. Her position as the queen of honky tonk is truly unassailable. After a few sides of country gospel, Wells made her breakthrough with the honky tonker. I heard a jukebox playing and followed it up with an answer record to Hank Thompson's classic, The Wild Side of Life, which had spent 15 weeks at number one. It wasn't God who made honky tonk angels, which spent six weeks on top of the charts and became the first ever solo number one for a female artist. Wells went on to rack up 30 top 10 hits, including the longest running number two in country chart history, Make and Believe, which spent 15 weeks as the bridesmaid behind Webb Pierce's record setting number one in the jailhouse now. She was the first woman to headline a national country music tour. She hosted her own TV show. She was voted most popular female country music personality for 16 years straight. When her husband, Johnny Wright, passed away in 2011, he and Wells had been married a month short of 74 years. Jean Shepard, at one point the longest running continuous member of the Grand Ole Opry. Jean was a genuine Oki who immigrated to California with her family and was raised outside Bakersfield. Possessed of a strong, brassy voice, she worked away into Hank Thompson's band, and when Kitty Wells broke, Thompson began working to get Jean a recording contract. In 1953, she hit number one with a duet with Ferlin Husky, a Dear John letter, and she went on to play 73 top 40 hits all up. The most hardcore of country traditionalists, she had a feud with Olivia Newton-John when in 1974, ONJ won the CMA's Best Female Singer Award. Shepard founded an organisation to lobby the CMA to keep pop-influenced acts away from the podium. But there was tragedy in Jean's life. Her husband and father of her one-year-old and an unborn child, Hawkshaw Hawkins, perished in the plane crash which took Patsy Cline and Cowboy Copas. Just as every soul singer in the 1960s had to stand comparison with Sam Cooke and usually came off the worst for it, it was a similar misfortune for women in country music to be measured against Patsy Cline. Born as Virginia Hensley in her namesake state, she moved around a lot as her father sought work as a blacksmith. A near fatal bout of rheumatic fever with a bad throat infection changed her voice to what she described as a booming Kate Smith bellow. She sang in church and was a good piano player. By 14, she was appearing on the radio and with a chaperone singing in nightclubs. She wrote to the Opry requesting an audition in 1947. Klein and her whole family drove eight hours to Nashville and slept in a park to make the audition, which she performed for Moon Mulligan, CB74. Mulligan was positive, but the Opry never got back to Klein. 
She continued to perform locally for a number of years, taking the stage name Patsy Cline in 1953 when she married. She joined the cast of Connie Gay's Town and Country Time television show. Connie Gay is probably the most important person in country music that no one's ever heard of in 1953 and quickly became the star of the show. She started recording for Coral in 1955 and made some good honky-tonk and sometimes borderline rockabilly songs, which didn't sell too well. But when she moved to Decker, she had a huge hit with Walking After Midnight. She joined the Opry in 1960 and beginning with I Fall to Pieces, she began a run of top tens that all crossed over onto the pop charts. By this point, the artistry in her voice, her ability to inhabit a lyric, her mesmerizing control of emotion and the subtleties of dynamics were utterly supreme. It was said she could rewrite a song just by singing it. Surviving a horrendous car wreck, she recorded her last sessions for Decca in February 1963, which included the classics Faded Love, Sweet Dreams and He Called Me Baby. Barely six weeks later, she was dead killed when her plane crashed in thick woods during a thunderstorm. She was a singular talent, a remarkable human being, and a bitterly sad loss to music. Dotty West. Sassy, a little larger than life, and a lot louder than it sometimes, and one of the most popular personalities in Nashville, Dotty was a local girl coming from the hamlet of Frog Pond, Tennessee, about 60 miles out of Nashville. In 1961, Dotty and her husband Bill moved to Nashville, where they befriended a number of up-and-coming songwriters, including Roger Miller and Willie Nelson. Around the same time, West met her best friend and mentor, Patsy Cline. She played on the same bill with Cline the night that Cline took her final flight. In 1963, West had her first big hit with Let Me Off at the Corner and the next year's top five, Here Comes My Baby, which won the Grammy for Best Country Recording, making her the first woman to win the award. Her career went into overdrive though in the 1980s when she had a makeover from a very conservative image to a spandex clad pop country songstress and she ended up placing 42 top 40 hits including five number ones, two of which were duets with her good friend Kenny Rogers. Dottie died in 1991 as a result of injuries she suffered in a car crash literally in front of the Grand Ole Opry. Loretti Lynn, the coal miner's daughter from Butcher Hollow, Kentucky, was a latecomer to country music. She didn't cut her first record until she was 28. Arriving in Nashville in 1960, she joined the Opry in 1962, and from 1963 she began a steady string of top hits, both on her own and as duets with Ernest Tubb. Her 1967 single, Don't Come Home a Drinkin' with Lovin' On Your Mind, became the first country number one hit written by a woman. All in all, she ran up 50 top 20 hits with 10 number ones. Lynn's songs opened up new frontiers for sexual frankness and for assertion of female identity, not just in country music. In the 70s, she stopped writing songs because of a dispute with her publishing company. So she sought out songs who weren't afraid to take that edgy stand. One's on the way, The Pill, which so terrified her label they held it back from releasing it for three years, and the classic cheating song When the Tingle Becomes a Thrill, kept her at the forefront of the nascent farmanist movement. I just made that word up, and I think it's kind of nifty. More likely, she resonated with the expansion of liberal values in the southern emigre female population who'd moved from a more restrictive rural society. After a mini-revival in 2004 with the Jack White-produced Van Lee Rose, she reclined in the splendour of being the living queen of country music. Loretta died in October 1922 at her longtime home in Hurricane Mills in Tennessee. Tennessee-born, Alabama-raised Melba Montgomery grew up singing in church and got her big break working in Roy Acuff's band in 1958. Her clear, pure Appalachian voice worked well with Acuff's highly traditional style. After five years, she left Roy and teamed up with his possible diametric opposite, Big Bad George Jones. While she recorded a series of classic duets with the Possum between 1963 and 67, songs like Let's Invite Them Over, We Must Have Been Out of Our Mind, and There's a Friend in the Way were big hits and established Melba as a presence in Nashville. Jones had other duet partners, but Melba was generally acknowledged as the best. But it became a dead end for Melba, and solo success was hard to come by. 
She only landed six top 40 hits as a solo artist in addition to 10 more as a duet partner, including the number one hit and pop crossover No Charge in 1974. By the night, she was concentrating more on songwriting and found a ready cue of takers for a song. Now 85 years old, Melba Montgomery, doyenne of the duet, still lives in Nashville. From a family of 15 children, Connie Smith's big hit Once A Day is an essential entry in any beginner guitarist's fake book. The first time a woman ever got to number one with her debut single and an eight week number one, setting a record which stood for over 50 years. It was also her biggest hit and tended to overshadow the rest of Connie's career, which is a shame because she made some good records, including 19 more top tens and winning 11 Grammy nominations and saw her act in several B-movies, being somewhat easy on the eye and all. She developed with producer Bob Ferguson a distinctive sound designed, like Motown records, to sound good on car radios which earned her a lot of airplay and her authentic style really related not just to women across the country audience but with other singers. Elvis Presley was a huge fan and Dolly Parton paid fulsome tribute. As she increasingly started to turn to gospel music in the 70s, she went into semi-retirement in the late 70s while she raised her family before she came back in the late 90s having lost none of her trademark vocal twang or grit. Narrowly escaping COVID's clutches in early 2021, she lives today with her husband, Nashville guitar legend Marty Stewart. Born in the tiny hamlet of Itawamba County, Mississippi, Tammy Wynette did more to change the role and perception of women in country music than just about any other singer. Lodging 20 number one hit singles, including three with her husband George Jones, with whom she shared a so terrible it would be funny if it wasn't real marriage, Wynette was, almost ignoring her talent as a vocalist, the first tabloid country music queen, and although she never meant to, drew the line between celebrity and credibility in country music. Beginning in 1966, when the terrific apartment number nine poked his nose onto the charts, Wynette had an incredible run of great, mainly self-penned songs. D-I-V-O-R-C-E, Your Good Girl's Gonna Go Bad, I Don't Wanna Play House, and of course the Hillary Clinton baiting Stand By Your Man. 17 of her next 25 singles made number one. Wynette, with her pliant mezzo-soprano, was renowned for her ability to wring every ounce of pathos out of a lyric without it sounding cloying or self-parodying. As the 1970s turned into the 1980s and the hits became no less frequent, but also lower charting, Wynette began to add a few Hollywood trappings to accompany the accelerating drama of her life, which all served to hide the fact that she was slowly killing herself with booze and opiate. By the end, in 1998, when she was only 55, she was a mere husk. Today, more than anyone else, it's those early Wynette records that are held up to young women entering the business as exemplars of how a woman can sing country music. It's sad that so few of them listen. There is no more famous, and nor has there ever been, a country singer than Dolly Parton. Fame or no, Parton is a peerless artist. More number one hits than any other female country artist with 25. A wonderful songwriter with a keen eye for little details. An amazing spinto soprano. Spinto sopranos are a rare type of soprano with a darker timbre who has the fluidity of a lyric soprano but can handle more dynamic pieces and sings with the orchestra rather than over the top like a lyric soprano would. Some of the great Wagnerian heroines are sung by spintos. Famously born and raised in a one-room boomer in Pittman Center, Tennessee, Parton first established herself as a songwriter, then as a TV star with Porter Wagner, all the time releasing good to excellent albums. Her um, Bubbling Over album from 1973 shamelessly sports, however, one of the worst album covers ever. Her songs about her upbringing, Dirt Poor, were always particularly effective, and Down From Dover from 1970's Fairest of Them All album is to my mind, one of the greatest and saddest dozen country songs ever written. On the same album, there's a song called Robert, a jaunty little number where a rich boy meets poor girl. They fall in love, but the girl has a secret. She's his sister. Don't worry, nothing icky happens. 
By late 1970s, especially with the pop crossover success of Jolene in 1974, Parton decided to test the waters as a pop singer. Seven top 40 hits and two number ones later, she considered the world sufficiently conquered to concentrate on her movie career, which had begun so well with 9 to 5. After a fallow spell in the 80s, Dolly diversified again, becoming a successful businesswoman until the 2000s saw her move back to traditional country and venturing into bluegrass and even red dirt Americana. She hasn't had a solo number one since 1989, but who cares? She's larger than life. She has beaten not only Nashville, but the whole damn world at its own game. She is universally beloved. She has transcended country music. She is Dolly Parton. One of the brightest, most headstrong, most adventurous artists in country music today is Texan Miranda Lambert. Comparison with Taylor Swift are inevitable, but Lambert lacks Swift's monumental hubris. Although, is it hubris if you can back it up? Also, Lambert has, unlike Swift, a sense of humour. Quite a wicked one. She can write and sing the weepies with the best of them, but she also pulls out sassy, witty, and occasionally nasty songs, playing her part of the woman who is mad, bad, and dangerous to know. The criticism is, of course, that occasionally she veers too far into country rock territory, although when she does that, the songs are usually straight bangers like Little Red Wagon or Something Bad. But when she sings a song like Tin Man or her superb honky tonk or Way Too Pretty for Prison, all is forgiven. Country music these days dresses in the cloth that's been cut, but at least Miranda Lambert knows the difference between style and fashion. She's as real as the deal gets these days. Texas-born, North Carolina-raised Tift Merritt is a genuine quadruple threat. A pure, true country singer with a folky background, a fantastic, sensitive songwriter with an eye for simple human details, a formidable guitarist, and a genuine thinker about how she wants to make her music and what she wants her music to say. Beginning in 2002 with her outstanding debut Bramble Rose, Merritt has continually sought new inputs and inspirations, writing her Another Country album in a small pension in Paris, teaming with classical pianist Simone Dinestine for the strange, unclassifiable night album or paying tribute to her favourite album, Dusty in Memphis, on her record, Tambourine. Merritt will never be a Taylor Swift level seller, not even a Miranda Lambert level seller, but you can't help but feel she has a lot of great music still in her and that someday more fashionable sponsors will take up her cause and she, true to herself, will be unimpressed by that eventuality. There are many, many other great female singers working the fringes of folk, country, alt country, red dirt, what have you, many of whom are direct inheritors of the great tradition set down from the Carter family onwards. People are quick to damn country music and it's done a lot of damnable things these last two decades, but there are artists out there who give a damn and as ever in the form, women are in the vanguard.